Hi, welcome back to Open Relationships, Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller, joined by my amazing co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and our amazing producer, Brian Atkins. My guest today is Stanford University neuroscientist, Dr. Jim Doty. Oh my gosh. Jim will teach you how to manifest what you really want and how to avoid what you don't want. The science is real and it is compelling and honestly, really surprising. So let me introduce our guest, Dr. Jim Doty. James R. Doty is a Stanford University neurosurgeon, neuroscientist, compassion researcher, entrepreneur, inventor, philanthropist, former chairman of the Dalai Lama Foundation, founder of Happy AI, which we'll talk more about, an avatar companion for mental well-being. He's a podcast host, a manifestation master, and best-selling author of the book, Into the Magic Shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. For those of you who are watching, I'm holding the book up right now. It's beautiful. And Jim has just recently released his second beautiful book called Mind Magic, The Neuroscience of Manifestation and How It Changes Everything. Welcome, Parun Guru Shri Shri Jimmy G. <laughs> <laughs> I got uh, th- it. Yes, you did. Thank you for that honorific. Uh, <laughs> Listen, I'm a you, super fan. I, I'm, yes, uh, I'm, I'm uh, like bringing my A game because I'm a super fan. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, but but I will allow you to call me Jim. <laughs> okay. What All right. Honor. Yeah. Just just for the you know for, the, for brevity's sake, it'll, yes, it'll go exactly. back to the the long name uh, uh, next time we're together. So I would love to to attempt to take just a couple of minutes to summarize your very compelling, very, uh, gosh, improbable story to give context to the people listening or viewing who haven't read your book. So do you mind, I'm going to take a couple minutes. If I'm missing any big pieces or if I get something wrong, interrupt. And then I'd love to uh, start with all the questions we've prepared. Is that okay? Would, would, would you like me to do that summary? Because it, uh, it might be a little easier since I don't have to look at notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Although go for although it. you may know it much better than I actually. Uh, so uh, for your listeners who may not be aware of the type of work that I do or my background, um, of course, all of us have a backstory, and a backstory uh, for most of us defines who we are today. And uh, my backstory is that. I grew up in a very challenging background. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. My mother had had a stroke when I was a child, was partially paralyzed, had a seizure disorder, and uh, was chronically depressed, attempted uh, suicide multiple times. We were on public assistance essentially my entire childhood. Uh, we were evicted from various residences. And as you can imagine, this is not the typical success story for most individuals who grow up in these types of environments. And in fact, there is a scoring system called Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale. And if you have mental illness, uh, drug or alcohol abuse, poverty, these dramatically impact one's ability to overcome and be a success by what uh, society defines. And Unfortunately, in our Western capitalist society, success is translated into wealth, power, and position with the idea that somehow by obtaining these, you will then be happy. Now, we're going to have a discussion about that because the reality, uh, this is about as far from truth as you can get. But I think hopefully that summarizes my story a little bit with the only add-on that um, when there would be difficulty at my house, I would often get on my bicycle and ride in a, as fast and as far as I could away. And on one of those excursions, I ended up at a strip mall where there was a magic shop. And I walked into the magic shop because I had an interest in magic and uh, I had lost this plastic thumb that I would use for various tricks. And I went in and uh, there was a woman sitting at the counter. I would call her an earth mother Uh, Some of you may not know what that term means, but regardless, she was a person who, and I'm sure we've all met people like this, 
who you just feel comfortable with. She has a radiant presence. Uh, she has a smile that just wraps around you and makes you feel comfortable. And in the language of uh, psychology today, for me at least, she created uh, this uh, environment of psychological safety where you felt comfortable talking to her. And it turned out she was not the owner, but the owner's mother who was minding the store while he did an errand. But the important thing is that after about 20 or 30 minutes, she said to me, I really like you. I'm here for another six weeks. And if you show up every day, I think I could teach you something that could really help you. And what she ended up doing was uh, teaching me what would today be called a mindfulness practice. This was in 1968 before such terms were used, nor the term neuroplasticity or an understanding of neuroscience, at least on any deep level. Based on that conversation, uh, she made me realize that uh, I was living in constant trauma and uncertainty and chaos. And as a result, my muscles were tied. It was very hard to focus. So she taught me a relaxation practice, a focus practice, uh, being present, if you will, and ultimately a visualization practice. And that combination really did change the trajectory of my life. Well, I'm I'm going to add on to that, and thank you for that that um, foundation. And her name is Ruth, and she sounded wonderful. And we'll come back. I do have a, other questions about Ruth, but I wanted to add just because you you talk about the severe experiences, abuse, and so forth you had growing up, and you go on to become you had a um, a vision to be a doctor, and you ended up uh, getting into. Uh, University of California, Irvine, like with so many improbabilities. I, I mean, you go into detail in the in the book and then you talk about how you didn't you um, your moxie enabled you to get in front of the medical board because they said, look, you don't even deserve to apply to medical school. And you convinced them you ended up getting into one of the finest medical schools in the world, Tulane University. Without having graduate, without having gotten your undergrad degree, you ended up making many, many millions of dollars, becoming a super successful neurosurgeon, neuroscientist, entrepreneur, inventor. You hold multiple patents, and you achieve these incredible heights, and it all came crashing down. And then you built it back up. And so, what I want to just ensure our our um, listeners and viewers get is this sense of very, very humble, adverse beginnings to extraordinary success financially in terms of your prestige, your education, uh, you're in partnership with the Dalai Lama. And at the same time, you lost your family, you repeated, you drank too much, you repeated patterns that you experienced growing up. And I give that, I really want to drive that context home because when I read your books and came to know your story, it just gave me that much more heart and hope in my own life, having been raised uh, in an alcoholic, chaotic, dysfunctional family, as well as others who go, wow, I want to hear more. I want to learn from this dude. So that's well, and little, I, Oh, go ahead. Joanna. I want to say, Andrea and I have learned the story of how you talked to the admissions board for medical school. And just to sum up for other people, correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, you said, I'm not going to allow you to objectify me based on what it looks like on the surface, my grades or my academic record. And you were able to convince them that you deserved a spot. And we think about that so much. And we talk about it from like hiring practices to how we talk about other people, how we talk about ourselves. It's like, I'm not going to let you turn me into this, put me in this little box. And like one, one dimensional. Is, yeah. This one yeah. dimensional being that can just be defined in a very limited capacity. Do you think that that's something that could happen today? Like, can you envision that happening in today's environment? Sure, I think it Well, I, I mean, I think that creating artificial criteria that only at its most periphery has any relationship to a position uh, that you're striving for uh, is uh, continuing and ongoing. And whether that's in the uh, corporate world uh, where there's a prejudice towards perhaps males and even uh, individuals of a certain age, or in the film industry, as you may know, in terms of equal pay, or in other environments, there are judgments that are made that uh, in some ways get embedded into the corporate uh, practice uh, that are unfair and ridiculous and have no relationship 
to how that relates to doing the job. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, having a reasonable amount of intelligence is important if you're going to be able to process all the information necessary to be a good doctor. But certainly uh, having someone, as an example, with a 4.0 who has no empathy, no kindness, and is ruthless uh, does not make a good doctor. And so, you know, oftentimes because there are limited positions available, artificial criteria are created to immediately weed people out. But the problem is it weeds people out who are actually good people or wonderful people. And now you're stuck with the people who met this criteria, but at what cost was that? Now, I certainly understand you have to increase efficiency, but I would suggest there must be some way we can leave the door open to allow others who may be different, a quirky, uh, a different way of looking at the world uh, to achieve success in some of these other environments. You know, it's sort of interesting if you look at the Hollywood environment, and many of the people who run some of the studios, uh, do they have any criteria? No, they worked in the mail room for 10 years and met all these people and each step along the way, somebody was nice to them and promoted them. Well, how does that correlate with becoming a successful head of a studio? It doesn't whatsoever. It just happens to be that they got to know the person as a human being and not based on, as an example, a, a grade point average. Wouldn't you also add that there's a high degree of passion involved and, you know, it, I mean, intention, persistence. I mean, for people who are willing to exhibit those traits and in your like you did exhibit that moxie and say, I'm not willing to be uh, objectified. Right. I mean, that's available to everybody. Well, of course I, I it a is. lot of people just don't understand that 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 agency has to come from within if if they're facing societal headwinds that are saying, no, you don't meet these criteria. All right, well, let me find a way. No, I think that's exactly right. The problem is uh, many people have limited belief systems. And if somebody says, I can't, it's not possible, by definition, that becomes truth. And so many people, unfortunately, give their self-agency away uh, to external narratives, people who say, you have to do this, you have to do that. Uh, and they sit there and go, oh, okay. Well, I mean, if I believe uh, all the negativity which people express towards my own personal possibilities, I would not have accomplished anything. So I think it's absolutely critical that an individual understand that they have immense power within their mind to either achieve or not achieve. Well, I think Henry Ford some, said something to that effect, right, a uh, hundred plus years ago, whether I believe you can or you can't, you're right, right? I mean, so in in some ways, some of these ideas, and probably quite a few of them, maybe even are thousands of years old, um, but I'd love to have you explain how people's lives change by approaching manifestation the way that you prescribe. Can you just take us back to, like, very basic uh, kind of the 101 in terms of your, you know, your teachings? Uh, sure. Uh, of course, manifestation has been around for thousands of years. Uh, it has its foundation in the first and second century with the Hermetics. Uh, and then uh, the New Thought Movement and Napoleon Hill, etc. But most recently, uh, there's been a book that was very popular called The Secret. And uh, the problem with manifestation and how it is used in sort of uh, the public lexicon is, one, this idea of a law of attraction and that there is some entity force uh, in the universe that will listen to your positive narratives about what you want and then grant you the wish of having them. And, uh, of course, in my view, as a scientist, this is nonsense. Uh, uh, there is nothing out there that's going to give you what you want. And uh, don't get me wrong, belief can be very powerful, as we were just talking about, but it's not belief that there is something outside yourself. What you have to understand is your mind is an extraordinarily powerful instrument, instrument for change in yourself and your environment. And it is what decides, as you just said with the quote from Henry Ford, 
if you say you can't, then that's truth. If you say I can, then that opens unlimited possibilities. But unfortunately, so many people by the nature of uh, our society, which can be in very, uh, very judgmental, uh, will often tell you it's not possible. And many times it's even from people who are friends or relatives. And, you know, when you hear a statement like that, <clears throat> which I have to say sometimes is, make, is, is used to make someone feel more important or more powerful, it can be crushing uh, to some people. Uh, I fortunately, uh, through what Ruth taught me and my own experience, uh, uh, decided nothing's impossible. And it's interesting because uh, in, in the first book, I think I repeatedly used the term unacceptable. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that has served me well, because if you force people to look beyond the normal criteria for which they would be judging you, uh, then magic can happen. If somebody sees you for who you are, your persistence, your aggressiveness, your desire to accomplish something, uh, oftentimes uh, they can relate to that and now look at you as a person. And they cannot look at you uh, away from you if you now become a human being and not a number. And I think so how that, do you use that term except you said unacceptable where does that what is a practical way in which you would use it like perhaps an example or something more specific well uh, again the nature of modern society makes people afraid of being judged and so you have to overcome that and uh, you know it sounds obviously easier said than done but you have to do it and the thing is a lot of people are afraid to hang over an abyss without a safety net but you have to be able to do that if you're to move forward. You have to be able to try, and you will fail. You may be embarrassed, but it doesn't negate the power of moving forward and being persistent. You know, there's a study that showed that, as an example, in the context of sales, it takes an average of repeating, <laughs> knocking on the door seven times before somebody will listen. Well, if you knock on the door once or twice and you turn away, well, uh, then you're not going to get the door answered. But if you're ruthlessly persistent, uh, you may get the door answered. Now, I'm not saying you you know, call somebody 20 times after midnight just to annoy them, but there are ways to do it where you just show your enthusiasm and your uh, persistence. Uh, there is nothing uh, pretty much that I've accomplished without that. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a big believer. My dad always says you create your own luck. Right. So if you're willing to knock on that door multiple times and show up with a good attitude and be prepared, well, then you can someone could say, well, you've manifested that someone else could say you were you were prepared and you created your own luck. But going back to the, um, the universe doesn't give a bleep about us. So how does manifesting work? Well, uh, I think there are a couple points to clarify before we go into the deep details. And one is the reality that all of us are manifesting all the time. I was uh, going to ask you about that. Okay, got it. Keep yeah. going. Plus, uh, most of us do it very inefficiently. It says, as an example, what is the difference between an amateur and an expert? Well, it's time, effort, uh, uh, creating habit. And most of us have not created habits around manifesting. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you have to understand the difference between what you think you need or want versus what you really need and want, because that has an impact on things. And then also not being uh, totally attached to an outcome. So let me just back up and start with uh, uh, the reality that we're all manifesting and also the reality that this idea of manifesting, which is fundamentally embedding or creating uh, neural pathways that uh, aligned, uh, are aligned with your intention. And the way you do that is through uh, actually repetition and utilizing your various sensory organs to strengthen that uh, message to your subconscious such that it gets embedded and you are creating neural pathways. So it does require effort, it requires habit, it requires repetition multiple times. But one of the challenges for so many people is that they don't appreciate that they are already carrying 
habits or uh, behaviors that they have grown up with. And this is the baggage that so many of us carry uh, throughout our lives. And if you don't understand how many of these uh, habits or behaviors that you've learned during critical parts of your development as a child, then it's hard for you to manifest. And what I mean by that is, as an example, if you grow up in an abusive uh, 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 family, uh, parents or caregivers, and you know they hurt you in some way and then tell you they love you, well, then you start confusing uh, what love means. And uh, I'm sure you've met people who say, you know, this is my third marriage. I'm going through a divorce now, and it seems as though I picked the exact same partner I don't understand. Well, the reason you don't understand is you've not gone back and looked at these patterns of behavior which for many people are not sort of immediately at their beck and call. You have to work with that. And now that can be simply finding someone who you trust to sort of go over things with you or a therapist. But once you become aware of the patterns that you have used or created to define yourself, well, then you can change them. So that's, that's part of the work. The other aspect here is... I mentioned is understanding the difference between what you think is important or what you want versus what you need. And what I mean by that is, especially in our Western capitalist society, we define success as a wealth, power, position. And if you somehow get that, then that oftentimes is equated with happiness. Now, of course, we know uh, that that's not true in many instances, but the average person doesn't know that. The other problem is that in our society, people are so afraid of being judged that instead of being their authentic self, they try to create a narrative of the stuff that I have. The stuff that I have means I am me and I'm important. And of course, what they are looking for is uh, external affirmation, but it's a fear narrative. It's based out of insecurity. I have to have this to be whole. People have to see this. When they see this, they know that the projection I am putting out there is real, but in fact, they know truly nothing about you. Well, and And that that was so compelling in your story, and I appreciated your vulnerability, that you had the most impressive trappings, multiple fancy European cars you either were buying or bought an island, you know, many millions of dollars, all this prestige, and and yet it was, as one of my friends likes to say, you weren't living from the inside out. You were living from the outside in. No, I think that's actually a perfect uh, analogy and truth. Uh, uh, I was waiting for all this external affirmation, which, in fact, I did. But in some ways, it's people giving you what looks like food that has no calories. Cheetos. I never got yeah. <laughs> I will not use a brand name on this show. Oh. Uh, uh, okay. uh, but <laughs> I mean, just Cheetos are delicious. Yeah, yeah why are you yeah. defaming Cheetos? That's yeah, like my favorite food. I, I was right. just okay, going to go. I, I, I was just saying they don't have, they, you know, we're not getting a lot of vitamin C from them. Uh, I was just <laughs> reaching for my bag of Cheetos here when you said that. Uh, uh, but uh, you're right. I, I mean, uh, there are some things that have no calories or something that have calories that are not particularly good for you. But regardless, this seeking external affirmation uh, is a dead end. It will never uh, uh, quench that thirst or that emptiness that you have to make you feel that you're good enough. And that's the problem here is so many of us have a negative self-talk that uh, we keep looking outside of ourselves. And in some ways, this is the narrative of also uh, seeking permission from the universe. One quick example of what he's that he's saying, like, let me run this by you and see if I've got it right. What we think we want, and then it, when you dig deeper, it's not really what you need. So I'm thinking about, we were just talking about my rosacea. So I think I want my red face to be less red, right? When I dig deeper in that, like I'm manifesting having a less red face. And when I dig deeper, it's like, I want to just accept that I'm a little bit of a pink faced gal, right? That's what I, that's what I need, right? Like, go a little deeper. It seems shallow, but in reality, it's getting rid of the redness on my face is not actually going to make me happy, right? Well, th- th- that's right. And actually, maybe I have rosacea. My face looks really red. So uh, maybe I'm really <laughs> Could be the lighting, Jim. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Uh, it could have been the sun. Uh, but anyway, yeah. uh, regardless, and uh, Joanna, to be honest, I didn't notice your red face, so it doesn't well, really matter. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but but uh, this is an issue, right? I mean, ideally, we we would all be comfortable with the skin we're in. Yet, uh, and it's interesting, right? You'll see what you and I may think of as an extraordinarily attractive man or woman. Yet, if you talk to them, they go, you know, if my biceps was just a little, little bigger, or if my breasts were X, Y, or Z, or if I was just two inch taller, two inches taller, my life would be better. The problem is, it's none of those things. I'm sure you have seen people who may not have uh, X, Y, or Z, but their mere presence just makes you feel good to be around them. They don't have to be externally pretty. They don't have to be slim and trim. Just being around that person, you're like going, wow, I love this person's energy. And that is the power we have to give ourselves when we let go of our external concerns. Well, so how what role do compassion and gratitude play in, I mean, to the extent, and if we have time, I would love for you to walk us through a simple manifestation exercise. If there's even something that Ruth taught you, that'd be super cool. But just to give some context, since you talk a lot, you've done compassion research, you started the Compassion uh, Center in um, at Stanford, Compassion and Altruism. So what role does compassion have in all this? Well, actually, uh, compassion is the fundamental foundation uh, which has allowed our species to survive. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, unlike other species, our species has a very small litter. You know, we don't produce a thousand babies uh, uh, every nine months. We produce one and maybe two and rarely three. And uh, uh, those offspring, unlike other species, they don't run off into the forest or into the jungle. They require us to care for them for 10 to 15 years. Well, uh, why would you do that? The reason you do it is because we have a genetic imperative to do so. We, when you care uh, for your child, as an example, if the child is in pain, is suffering, is hungry, uh, when you act and alleviate that suffering, and the definition of compassion is the recognition of another suffering, with a motivational desire to alleviate that suffering, well, you're rewarded. And the way you're rewarded is the release of different neurotransmitters, primarily oxytocin, which I'm sure you know is called the love, bonding, nurturing uh, uh, hormone. That actually stimulates the pleasure and reward centers in your brain. And as a result, you feel good when you care. But the other aspect, which is just as interesting, is it also has a profound effect on your peripheral physiology as well as your brain. Well, in the context of your brain, when you are in that state, which is actually engagement of what we call your parasympathetic nervous system, which is part of your autonomic nervous system, you are And calm. that's the rest and digest. That's when you're, you're calm, you're relaxed, right? Correct. C uh, compared to the sympathetic nervous system, which we call our flight, fight, or freeze, or uh, fear response. When you're in that mode, uh, your cardiac function is uh, improved or works at its best. Your blood pressure is lowered. Your immune system's boosted. Uh, the release of stress hormones is diminished. Uh, the expression of inflammatory proteins, which are associated with chronic disease states, is diminished. And so there are all of these positive aspects that uh, occur when you're engaged or activate or uh, stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. And, uh, uh, and also, in terms of brain function, our cognitive brain networks function at their best in that mode versus when you're stressed, it's just the opposite. When you're stressed, because this is associated with our survival mode, you're not looking for a million choices. Uh, you're trying to find the shortest and fastest way for you to avoid uh, being killed, potentially. And as a result, it shuts down your executive control area, as an example. 
which is associated with memory and prior experience because it's creating the shortest path to survive. Now, on the savanna in Africa 200,000 years ago, that was a great strategy. Uh, you would see the grass move. You knew a predator was there. You acted. Your sympathetic nervous system was uh, activated, and hopefully you survived. And then you come immediately down to your baseline, which is engagement of the rest and digest or parasympathetic nervous system. The problem is that in modern society, and we can go a little bit deeper into that if you'd like, but in modern society, it's a completely different situation. By the because nature Because people of, are chronically stressed? Yes, absolutely. Well, they're, mm -hmm. I should say modern society has resulted in people being chronically stressed and anxious which of course has a negative impact on their physiology and their brain function. Uh, and it actually limits our ability to see the true nature of reality, which is that uh, everyone is suffering and that as a species, we are meant to connect and, and uh, care. Yet, if you're always in a fear mode, this shuts this down. You pull in, you're not interested in other people's opinion because you're just trying to survive. And I think that's a critical part of uh, understanding of how we can limit ourselves. So can you take us through a kind of the basics that Ruth taught you? Uh, sure. So one of the aspects, uh, especially uh, in growing up in environments like you and I did, Andrea, uh, uh, Joanna hasn't shared her background, so. Uh, oh, I grew up the same as Andrea. I grew up from an alcoholic family, divorced, the, the whole the whole gamut. <laughs> that's why we're all attracted to each other, yeah, I think. Yeah, uh, that, that, <laughs> that, that, that's our tango, apparently. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, when you grow up in these types of environments, of course, w what happens? One is it's completely unpredictable and chaotic. And as a result, what happens? You never know what's going to happen next. As a result, your muscles are always tense and you're always looking around. So you don't have the ability to focus and to attend. Uh, and again, this is from a fear narrative because you don't know what's going to happen. And it's as if you're a goldfish in a fishbowl. If the water's dirty, you have no idea that the water's dirty, right? That's what you're used to. Uh, so what Ruth did was to make me understand that was in fact the case. And I didn't even know I was, if you will, stressed or anxious or my muscles were tight. So she taught me a practice that's now recognized, if you will, in the mindfulness circles, a, a body survey to intentionally relax uh, the muscles throughout my entire body to get me to a place where I can relax. And then the other aspect is, and these, again, types of chaotic situations, you're always looking around uh, because you never know what's going to happen versus focusing on one thing, the most important thing, whatever that is. As an example, you're always looking around, even though you may have a project or something you have to get done, you never know what's going to happen. So this just becomes a- uh, You're hypervigilant uh, uh, and that, that takes a lot of your bandwidth, right? Rather than saying, all right, I'm going to calm and then I can, I can actually ha reclaim that agency by being intentional and focusing on the thing that I want so that my, my brain gets used to that thing right so in that way we're we're kind of calling that you know in your case you were passionate about being a doctor right and you you were able to call that to yourself even though you didn't graduate from college i mean like that's crazy this makes me also think like adhd and trauma there's got to be a lot of overlap because i always you know i'm diagnosed with pretty serious adhd but what you're describing and I'm recognizing in myself also feels like the result of growing up in that in that chaos and with trauma. Yeah, it's like that always looking around, always trying to have a distraction, always picking up the phone, always that buzzing yeah. also makes me feel that way. No, I think that's right. So uh, uh, so then she taught me how to attend, if you will, uh, through uh, meditating on a candle, uh, which allowed me to be present. Because if you can't be present, it's hard to learn, right? Uh, as we all know. Uh, and, uh, and once she did that, she also uh, made me aware of the negative dialogue that was going on in my head. And uh, oftentimes people think that that dialogue is truth. 
uh, is them. But what it is is something we call negativity bias because to survive, we had to pay attention to negative things. And unfortunately, uh, for many of us, that translates into being very hypercritical of ourselves. And if you repeatedly say, I'm not good enough, it's not possible, I cannot, that then becomes truth, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So then she taught me how to give myself positive affirmations to decrease the loudness of that message, if you will, or to make it less frequent. And, and what would some of those be for little Jim, who was going home and dutifully doing this every, every day for 12 years or however long Multiple you did Multiple times a day. Uh, wow. uh, well, okay. they, they, ha they haven't changed. <laughs> oh, amazing. Uh, uh, but I am worthy. I deserve love. Uh, um, it is possible. I can. And, uh, you know, these are very important statements to make and, well, and, and they're to so believe. I just have to chime in and say they're so universal. They're so basic. And and just going back to this idea of, yeah, the three of us, uh, you know, are attracted, you know, due to the you know trauma and chaos that we grew up with. But that's so common. Right. And so when I think about the uh, um, the lack, the the lack of love, the lack of importance, the you know, the lack of, of so many things that so many people grew up with. So for for all of us to be saying in this kind of process, I am worthy, I can, I deserve, you know, those things that you're saying, Jim, I mean, to me, that's like totally foundational to who we are as human beings. Well, the other thing that people don't appreciate, and you can look at the work of a guy named Dan Butner, you know, from the Blue Zones, uh, uh, if you look at how we lived several hundred years ago, uh, we lived in villages, we grew up there, we died there, we lived in multi-generational families, we had a community or a village that cared for us. And the thing is, they knew the good and the bad about us, but regardless, they still loved us. We did not have uh, a variety of media or other things in our environment that would beat us up and say, you didn't do this, you didn't accomplish that, you're not worthy, you're not good. The community, loved you and they knew the good and the bad and they still loved you so you didn't have this constant negative self-talk and that's why those villages uh, many of the people lived to be over 100 because they were living in the uh, parasympathetic nervous system mode the rest and digest mode versus being always activated by feeling not good enough and this whole idea of comparison uh so uh and again, it gets back to the same thing we said earlier. If you're a goldfish living in dirty water, you only know one thing. But when you see that you can swim to another bowl, if you will, or change the water or see the world through a different lens, suddenly go, oh, my gosh, this was there all the time. I just didn't know it. And so, you know, changing that negative self-talk, understanding uh, that you deserve love, but also once you're able to do that, you realize, uh, as you were saying, Andrea, that everyone is suffering a, in, a, in a different way, and you're much more sympathetic and kind. And what I tell people is once I changed how I looked at the world, because I used to look through the lens of anger and despair and hopelessness, uh, I recognize as an example that my parents, it wasn't a matter of them not loving me. It was they did not have the tools to help themselves. Bingo. Thank you. Right. And and just just to chime in on on that, because, again, you know, having come from so much of that chaos, I have, as I always love to say, two of the greatest kids in the world. And I find myself repeating some of those patterns and I just, oh, my God, I get so, you know, that I lived with and I get so annoyed with myself. And as I've grown older, um, I have found a just a profound amount of um, forgiveness and respect for my parents because, and, you know, I always say our kids are our are, are, are little Buddhas, right? They're there to to teach us and show us where the wounds still exist. But I, I believe in this just very humbling and, you know, the idea of, you know, blaming parents and so forth. It's like I just I try to avoid that because I, I do think, you know, our all this generational trauma is, you know, has caused our parents to do their best. And even if their best was terrible. And, and so it's back to, okay, what can we do to learn from that? But all right, so going back, so, so just to summarize, so she, Ruth would have you go through a body scanning, relaxing the body. She'd then have you do a meditation. And in your case, you talked about using a candle. You talked about reducing the negative 
talk and, you know, that negativity bias. And then you talked about replacing that with the positive and uh, I'm worthy of love, you know, I'm whole, those kinds of things. And then then what were the next steps? Well, again, it was looking at the world through the different lens, the lens of compassion, which is critically important and uh, recognizing that everyone's suffering. But once I was able, and I won't use the term master those techniques, but once I became familiar with them and was able to use them, uh, she taught me a visualization technique, uh, which ultimately is a manifestation technique. Now, the problem for me at that time, though, was that, one, I had zero self-awareness. I was 12 years old, and I was poor. And so when she said, make a list of 10 things that you want uh, to visualize, uh, uh, I chose, uh, and as you know, I wanted to be a doctor, but it wasn't that I wouldn't be a good doctor or I didn't understand about caring for people, but a major part of it was I wanted to be recognized as having become something, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah, being that's a doctor. the external, right? Living yes, from the yes. outside in. Yes, and mm -hmm. so that was part of it. Uh, part of it was, again, I wanted to have a mansion where people could see I was successful. I wanted a, um, a Porsche. Uh, I wanted a island. I wanted uh, a Rolex watch. And uh, ultimately, I did get all of those things. And uh, it's interesting because, again, we're talking about external uh, affirmation. I had all of my friends saying, man, you, you, you've made it, man. You've got everything. This is fantastic. Uh, and, you know, at one time I had a Ferrari, a Porsche, a Range Rover, a BMW, a Mercedes. And uh, yet uh, none of it made me feel good. And I was dating very attractive women. I was flying around in private jets. So by every criteria, I, quote unquote, was important. You had but it I, all. You had I it had all. I had it all. And I, but I was not important. I, I was felt nothing. I felt emptiness. And uh, uh, so I couldn't understand that, why I was so unhappy. And then I guess Providence intervened to uh, give me some <laughs> inside and self-awareness. So uh, uh, what happened, as you know, uh, I had been very successful investing in some of the dot-com companies and made about $78 million. And uh, then uh, the dot-com crash came. And I had borrowed about $15 million from the bank. And, um, of course, the bank realized that I had no money when the dot-com crash happened. So they were kind enough to give me a call and ask me when I was paying back that money. And uh, I was $3 million in the hole. And so this resulted in me selling everything uh, and, uh, and reflecting on sort of what had I missed here. Which and, and this actually took me back to sort of ground zero again. And at that point, were you also estranged from your family? Uh, what happened was uh, I uh, ultimately got divorced. And that's there are many aspects of that that relate, and there are many that don't. But ultimately, uh, uh, I did get divorced. And, uh, and this was before uh, or... I guess the trajectory, upward tra trajectory, uh, was already occurring, uh, but this was long before the dot-com crash. Uh, and uh, so I ended up going back to my house in Southern California to try to reflect on the situation. And what happened was I realized that I was, uh, uh, what I had thought was important or what I thought I wanted actually uh, was not it at all. And uh, here I'd gone from literally rags to riches, having everything, having all this external positive affirmation, and now I'm back at ground zero. Now, I say uh, I was poor again, but don't get me wrong. I mean, I was a neurosurgeon and actually made more money than 99% of people. Uh, so I wasn't physically poor uh, or, or truly financially poor, but I was poor in spirit in the sense that I was lost and I didn't understand what had happened to me. And subsequently, uh, in conversations with my attorney and your banker and your attorney in my situation became my suddenly my best friends, uh, I had made some commitments to charity uh, in terms of a, a, a charitable donations and things. 
and uh, which, frankly, were not because I was the most charitable guy. Don't get me wrong, I was never super selfish, but it was for tax avoidance, right? I uh, got it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, they, they can uh, be both. They can both be true, right? And they were. Uh, but what happened is that uh, the attorney called me and he said, listen, you know, our junior partner had actually never filed the paperwork. You don't have to give all that money away. And it was in stock at a company that had yet to go public. And after this period but of- But it was great... still a ton of money. It was like $29 million, right? It was. It was indeed. And, and uh, right. uh, although I didn't know it was going to be quite that much. But uh, yeah, so I went ahead and said, go ahead and uh, I will live up to that commitment. And they gave all of that stock away. Uh, but what happened was it allowed me to create health clinics around the world, blood banks. It allowed me to create a program for adolescents affected by AIDS, HIV, programs for the disabled. I endowed chairs, uh, universities, including uh, Tulane University, uh, the dean's chair. Uh, It allowed me to rebuild the library there after Hurricane Katrina. So it allowed all of these incredible positive things to happen. But most importantly, it allowed me to uh, become friends with the Dalai Lama. I became chairman well, of the Dalai I, Lama just, Foundation. I just want to interject right there because in reading the book and you go through this and it's like very few people would have made that choice that you made. And what I what came to mind for me was a and just an amount of, if you will, like a nakedness and a saying, I am just going to I'm going to, you know, go bare to my core. I'm going to believe in myself. I'm going to do this thing like I'm going to walk the walk like nobody's walked the walk before. And it's like jumping into the abyss, right? I mean, that that feeling of, yeah, you still had your degrees and so forth, but that's a lot of that's a lot of money. And, you know, to have and to have gotten accustomed to living a certain lifestyle and so forth, to have that choice, are you gonna, you know, take the red pill or the blue pill? It's like that you said, I I am going to really stand by my values. I mean, to me, that's an extraordinary choice. And when I and, you know, you know, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but, you know, so I want to hear more. But I just I did want to, like, stop and have everybody think, ooh, what that takes to have that kind of courage and heart and gut. But then how that opened doors for you. So please keep going. Yeah. I, I mean, I have to tell you, I spoke to everybody I know and 100 percent, including uh, the woman I was just dating at the time, said you're an idiot to consider giving all the way. That kind of money away. Of away. Yeah. yeah, especially when I was $3 million in the hole. Uh, but uh, I did. And uh, it changed everything because what I tell people is it took me from rags to riches again, but in a different way. And it took me from- In the way that counts, right? Ex- exactly. So yeah, it, it, it wasn't about money per se. It was about who you are and what are your values and what do you want to be and uh, and that decision had a profound impact because from that, uh, I got to meet many of the leading spiritual and religious leaders in the world and become friends with them, counsel them, hang out with them, uh, learn from them. And uh, I mean, we're talking uh, the Pope, uh, we're talking Desmond Tutu, Thich Nhat Hanh, Amma, uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, uh, Saad Guru, Eckhart Tolle, Byron Katie. Uh, and and these people became really friends of mine, and I spent a lot of time with them. And so these people also live above their dogma. Uh, they see the world through the lens of connection, interconnectedness, interdependence, uh, a concept of oneness. Well, and it's freedom, right? I mean, ultimately, isn't that what we what we all really, really want, even though, you know, that may feel kind of esoteric. I mean, then you you really are are free. I feel like when you make that choice, you're not bound by the trappings. You're not living from the outside in. Instead, you're living your values. And rather than feeling, you know, attached and one might the other shoe drop. I mean, that just it just feels like such a um, profoundly validating, courageous act and you are rewarded for doing so. I well, hope and, I can and, be that courageous, in, you know, given the <laughs> chance. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure if you really want to be at the end of the day, but uh, yes, that would be an ideal goal. And some people could say, Jim, you were stupid, and I can appreciate their perspective. Uh, but uh, again, uh, what it did was it did liberate me because, you know, when you grow up in poverty, what's the thing that terrifies you the most? Being poor. So suddenly having everything that you could ever want and just 
throwing it away, and I don't say in literally, but I mean in the mean in the context of not using it for myself, it freed me, and uh, uh, and that was incredible because no longer was I always looking around wondering. Uh, you know, gosh, if I had this or I would do that. Now, don't get me wrong. It has been a painful decision sometimes. But in the big scope of things, uh, uh, it's also I've been very blessed. Would you do it again? Position. I mean, if hell, you had to go no, back. Hell no. No. <laughs> Uh, 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 you heard uh, it here uh, first, here, <laughs> folks. Jim Doty, he wants his money back. Yeah, Webbing. God damn it. Uh, uh, yeah. No, uh, mm-hmm. you, look, uh, would it have made my life a little bit easier to have a few million dollars in the bank for retirement? Sure. Uh, but that being but I said. Think, hang on. But I, I think it doesn't it change the act of it changes the energy. Right. Isn't that the whole point? Right. Yeah. I mean, and maybe you if you went back, you'd say, all right, let me, you know, keep five and still give away 24, which would still be magnanimous. But it's like something I feel like something changes inside that the likes of the Dalai Lama and the Pope and Byron Katie, who I just love and all these people that you referenced, that it's like it changes you. That action changes you. Right. And not that anybody would have blamed you for for, you know, choosing to keep that money. But it's like you show up differently. Right? No, uh, yeah, and you have immense power because you're not tugged by anything. You're you're liberated, and uh, no, it is uh, incredibly uh, uh, amazing to be able to do that. And it also shows to people, you know, if I had kept five, which would have been nice, it's not the same story. Exactly. <laughs> not, yeah. Not, no, not I got you. I, not that I was doing this for a no, story, no. but it's just right. a different energy or dynamic, and I can walk and make that statement, and it's truth. And it can never be questioned. And it gives me great power to able to say, look, I had everything. I chose to walk away because it wasn't in my best interest. But uh, getting back to what we were talking about, we talked about this love-hate narrative. You know, when you have all of these things and you believe that they define who you are, you hold on to them very tightly. And some people say, well, Jim, you know... uh, well, one, they'll say, you know, you had everything, in, but you chose to walk away. Okay, well, I want to try having everything. <laughs> I'll decide whether I walk away. But the other, but the, uh, uh, the other side is that um, when you have things and you're using them for external affirmation, you're never going to be happy. And it's not that I'm against owning a Porsche. I drive a Porsche. I, that's not the issue. The issue is, though, if they all go away tomorrow, I am perfectly okay. Not that I want them to, but if they do, it's fine. I've well, right, because you've you've got that you've got that that um, place in your heart that that you know the love, the connection. Which you know, again, coming from a family of of um, eating disorders and alcoholics, I mean, I'm an overachiever, and it's like you can never achieve enough, right? So my on my path, I've had to get to a place where it's like. Okay, I'm enough, right? Because uh, like all of these external trappings, there's always somebody who's a better entrepreneur, who's got a better podcast. It, you know, like it's never ending. So I'm I'm with you. Like that has to come from within. But I want to go back to a couple of quick things before we wrap. So you you finished up in um, Ruth had you make the list of ten things and visualize them. So. What are we talking about? 15, 20 minutes twice a day? Like, I, I know my listeners are going to want to like, okay, we want the practical stuff. So when it comes to doing that, like, what kind of commitment are we talking about? Uh, well, uh, it's like anything. The more you do it, the more likely it is to happen. It's like exercise. You know, if you if you show up for five minutes, then you're not going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. If you show up for four hours a day, you might. And so you have to decide how important something is. Now, I would never suggest that somebody spend their whole day thinking about how great they want to be or what they want. But that being said, you have to create and strengthen these neural pathways, and it comes through repetition uh, and utilizing your senses uh, so that you're getting the power of each one of them, which is additive. You think about it. You write it down. You read it silently. You read it aloud. You visualize you being in that position. And I did that over and over, I mean, literally probably hundreds of times a day for a number of years. And, uh, <clears throat> but again, it's like anything. Once you learn the practice and embed it within you, you don't need to do it either as long or the same way, right? So I think uh, that's uh, one aspect 
of it. Uh, but as you know from the book, uh, it actually offers you a six-week course, which in many ways is based on a mindfulness practice, or at least the ability to get into a calm state and be able to think and visualize how you want to be. And, you know, uh, we talked about manifestation, the woo-woo and the pseudoscience part, which we've discussed, but many of these practices are valid in the sense of writing things down and repeating them and things like that. It's just it doesn't work the way uh, that people think, and it's not going to work as well if it's about me. It has to be about we. And, ha and the thing, though, is once it becomes about we, it actually becomes much stronger. You're in a calm state uh, by its nature. And uh, you also change what is important to you. It's no longer important for you to uh, uh, have all of these things or to be recognized for all of these things. Many of them will come naturally if you care for people. And that's what a lot of people don't appreciate. The more you care, the more people actually want to help you. And uh, uh, so as a result, uh, everything changes and it changes for the good. Well, because you're it's changing how you're showing up. It's changing how you're interacting. And a couple of the things I, I wanted to underscore, you talk about um, not being attached to the outcome, which is super important. Right. And definitely not being attached to a certain timeline. So I just for everybody who's out there going, you know, willing to try it. I just want to say these are two really important um, lessons. And, and again, even back to the point you made about giving away your $29 million, the act of doing that changes you. And as somebody who's been journaling a long time and doing the various things that I've done to heal and so forth, um, I'm showing up differently. Right. And so, and, and so when I think about what you're, what you're advocating for is you're showing up differently your and you know back to like you can create your own luck you create your own reality well if you're that intentional and that clear in fact i want to just even um mention you talk about jim carrey's story i think a lot of us have heard about his famous 10 million dollar check right before he started his career he wrote a 10 million dollar check to himself from himself basically and it took a long time he kept the check in his um wallet and he did all these things like and he he came from an abusive, um, very difficult. I don't maybe it's not abusive, but a very difficult family. And and you you share so much more to that story, which I wasn't aware of how he would go up, I think, on Mulholland Drive and look over the city. He wanted to be an actor so dearly. He wanted um, and that the, um, everything changed for him like he was doing OK. And then when he realized what people like what he could deliver that people really wanted. But meantime, he'd been looking at this check for years, he would, would, um, vi you know, envision himself as being an actor that everybody wanted to work with. He was very intentional from, um, the, you know, the writing in your book, very intentional about, um, achieving those outcomes. And when I think about that story, it's okay. That intentionality impacts your behavior, right? You're not just sitting there in a cocoon somewhere, it's changing how you show up, right? So I, I just, I do want to make sure if I get, if I've gotten that wrong, tell me, but it feels like those dots connect. Yeah, well, I think uh, another analogy there's a, which I didn't include in the book, but which is a similar story is, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, right? He, he, had, he had a story which is, uh, you know, I've created all this wonderful new music, but every time I go on stage, everyone wants me to play Stairway to Heaven, right? And he used to get a lot of anger about that because it's my new music, damn it. You should want that. That's what you should want. And he had like, carried anger about that. And the thing was that once he pre-processed this, because you see before then it's about him, right? I want. Versus when he said, I, I now realize that so many of the people who grew up with me, they have incredible memories and experiences associated with that song. And when they, they, they hear the song, and one of the reasons, you know, they come to my concerts is to hear that song because it reenacts or, or makes them have the same feeling of that important moment in their lives. And once he shifted, and this is the, what the gift we all have to shift our perspective, he was saying, yes, that's why I'm here. I am of service. I'm here to serve. Yes. And that, yeah, that you beautifully talked about Jim Carrey having that 
realization and it's like and it, to me it all comes back full circle to how we show up you know really thinking about and and feeling that compassion um do you have time for two more questions because i wanted to ask you about two things if you have time andrea for you i have unlimited time oh oh I, my I, god watch out <laughs> we'll be here for days um i i wanted to ask you you talk about heart coherence which is something that i hadn't i mean i feel like i'm starting to hear more about this but I would love, you know, and what did I read recently that our um, hearts actually have many more nerves going into our brain than the other way around. So, you know, if you don't mind, just just, you know, in as simple terms as possible to help people understand what heart coherence is and why it's important, because to me, that physiology and understanding it and getting into the state of gratitude and compassion through meditation, through intentions is is really foundational to successfully manifesting and and to successfully manifest how are we showing up in the world so do you mind just talking about heart coherence for a sec sure well uh whether it's uh, we could call it coherence vibration oscillation but actually we have this in uh, our brain and we certainly have it in our heart and what people don't appreciate is that uh your mental state can actually affect the bioenergy or uh, of your heart, and this energy actually can extend three to five uh, feet outside of your body. But the point is, as human beings, we're actually attuned to a person's energy and uh, respond to it. And even though it's not at a conscious level, and there are other attributes that we have that people respond to, even though we may not appreciate it at a conscious level. I mean, I'm sure you appreciate oftentimes your partner may come in a room and they don't have to say anything, but you already know what's going on. Exactly. And, and those all... of us who are hypervigilant are very good at it. Yeah. Well, that's out of fear and making sure you're safe. But but yes, uh, uh, we are attuned to these things. So uh, uh, HeartMath, which is a company that has promoted uh, coherence, but there are other companies that do work in the area of heart rate variability. And in fact, I wrote a, a scientific paper called Heart Rate Variability and Compassion, actually. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, uh, when you are calm, when you're kind, when you're open, when you're thoughtful, this has a huge, huge effect. And those are the people, we talked about this radiant present, presence of Ruth and others. This is how you get there. The very nature of who you are is emanating positive energy around you. People want to be with you. And I'm sure you know people who, as soon as you see them, you want to go in the opposite direction. And and some people might call them energy eaters, right? They right, vampires, energy vampires, yeah. Yes, exactly, and versus other people. As soon as you get in a room with them, you go, oh, wow, I, I'm really enjoying this. This is a lot of fun. I really like these people. I wish this could go on forever. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, a choice. Kind of like this podcast, Jim. <laughs> damn straight. Damn straight. I agree with you. OK, la my last question. You talk a little bit in the book about your first book about um, some of your very esoteric. You know, we talk about the woo, some of your esoteric, even out of body experiences, some things that kind of freaked you out a little bit. What what are one or two of the most either interesting or improbable things that you've experienced in in your journey with this kind of work? Well, again, now you're going to make me talk about woo woo. So uh, I'm trying I want, to avoid. I, I love I, the woo woo, I, Jim. <laughs> I've been trying to avoid that, but uh, well, there there are probably two. Uh, okay. One is uh, uh, as those who read the book will learn. Uh, you know, my father ended up leaving to go uh, back to Kentucky for unclear reasons uh, when he was on a binge and uh, didn't bring any clothing. Ended up getting pneumonia. Ended up getting in the hospital at the Veterans Administration in Johnson City, uh, um, and uh, I got a call from the physician telling me he was quite ill. Uh, they weren't sure if he was going to survive. Uh, so I had actually prepared to go there to see him. And uh, I was supposed to leave the next morning at around, or to go to the airport around seven o'clock. And uh, somewhere around uh, three or four in the morning, I was awoken from sleep, and my father was at the end of the bed. Uh, and I have to say, 
he looked better than I had seen them. He had a smile on his face. He looked healthy. And he uh, uh, told me uh, he was okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and said he'd try to be the best father he could be and basically said goodbye. So now what does that mean? Was that real? Probably not. Did it make me feel good ultimately? Of course. Uh, uh, could it be due to I had eaten pizza? Maybe. Uh, and, and you know, what happened <laughs> at, you know, an hour or so later, the doctor called me and said uh, he passed. Well, regardless of what it was from, uh, it was very soothing, and I appreciated it. And I have, you know, chosen not to try to explain some of these things. Uh, the other experience I had was I was in a car accident, as you know, and uh, ended up uh, losing four liters of blood into uh, a fractured spleen uh, and having to go to emergency surgery for the second time uh, to deal with that. And I had uh, this experience where I was dying and was going down the classic river of light and heard uh, all of these, you know, voices of people who cared about me. And as I got closer to the light, I uh, knew I was going to die if I entered that, you know, a wall of light. And, uh, and then I said no, and I woke up and then I was in the intensive care unit. Uh, and that experience, a lot of people, uh, in fact, there's a neurosurgeon wrote a book called Proof of Heaven by Eben Alexander. And, and if you read the Esquire article associated with it, there's a slightly different narrative of that story. But regardless, it actually had no impact on me. I looked at it from a, a neurophysiologic perspective and understood how uh, hypotension uh, can affect uh, uh, the oxygenation to your brain. And then that can activate uh, uh, your occipital lobes, creating this sort of white light and of course, the deepest held memories you have are people you've cared about, right? So uh, anyway, you know, we have these things that people can attribute all sorts of mystical or, 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 or aspects with. Uh, but uh, I don't need those explanations, actually. It's all okay. Uh, as an example, I, my brother was an artist, and I have a couple of his paintings. And one of them sits outside of the bedroom. So when I leave, I see this painting. And every time, almost every day, it's crooked. I don't know why it's crooked. But every day, <laughs> it's straightened. And I say hello to my brother. Well, <laughs> what does that mean? It, it, but it's a way to calm us, to soothe us, to have a sense of the memories of people who we've cared for and loved but it doesn't need to make any sense. It, it just need, you just need to appreciate it. And again, this is not necessarily woo-woo. I understand it probably has no relationship to anything beyond the physical reality, but I don't care. It's okay. Uh, uh, and so I think there are places for that. It's just as, the, as long as you have clarity, though, if you do have the science or the knowledge, to acknowledge uh, that reality versus trying to sit there and create all these explanations for why it may have happened. But maybe I'm contradictory and it's all about woo-woo. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there has to be so much you know with being a medical doctor and knowing so much about the brain. You must also know that there is so much we don't know, right? Amen. Amen. I agree with Amen. both of you. <laughs> and yeah, on that and note... Yeah, all right. We would love to keep you here for days. Hopefully we'll get you back, but thank you uh, okay, hang on. I got it. I got it. I got it. Guru. Oh, uh, Guru. Where? Sure. No, no. Okay. Parim Guru. Oh, yeah. Pa Shri, I'm like, Shri, I'm looking Jimmy for my G. Okay. <laughs> what he said. Parim Guru, Shri, Shri, Jimmy G. <laughs> there you have it. Well, listen uh, to you. Thank you guys so much to your yeah, audience. I you. appreciate you listening. And I hope uh, this has been helpful to you. And also just remember, each of us every day has the ability to improve the life of at least one person. And whether that's by saying hello, by a smile, by hugging someone, it's within our power. And that simple <laughs> act can have so much uh, effect far beyond what you can even imagine. So uh, be kind. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, You guys Jim. take care.
You too. See you. Wow, what a show. Holy smokes. I don't know about you, but I am ready to go and start my new manifestation practice. There is so much I'm eager to bring into my life. Um, Okay, if you are curious about Jim's work, his books, you can check out James, uh, him at jamesrdotymd.com. We'll put that address in the show notes. Um, He's got these two beautiful books, Into the Magic Shop and Mind Magic. He's got a really cool podcast and um, uh, Instagram uh, uh, social presence as well. He has some really cool meditations on his website. Um, That's it for another amazing episode of Open Relationships. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did in creating it. I feel so energized and inspired. I can't even tell you. Um, And if you like our show, please follow us. Uh, We would love your feedback, your advice. You're welcome to email us at openrelationships at yourtango.com. We love getting your comments on YouTube and Spotify, iHeart, wherever you watch or listen to the episode. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.